Okay, let's get started. Uh, hello and welcome to the first and hopefully many educational sessions on threat preparation. My name is Christopher DiCenso. I'm a member of the Boston chapter of the FBI Citizens Academy Alumni Association. And our goal today is to share with you uh, through Patrick insights on how you can improve your situational awareness and if needed, prevent a threat against you or our communities. Now, we've conducted uh, three in-person active shooter workshops here in the Boston area over the past few years. And, and the topics have ranged from uh, preparing for a threat to actually after a threat has occurred and how to deal with it. Uh, lately, we've been focusing more on situational awareness, which is what the topic is today. So we hope you enjoy it. And if you do, we'll conduct more of these. Uh, give you a little sense, we have over, let's see here, 500 people uh, attending. Uh, registration list had over 46 states, including Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and Canada. Uh, as I looked at the registration list, we had many chiefs of police, uh, business owners, presidents, campus safety officers, uh, federal, state, and local law enforcement, a lot of directors of security for banks, hotels, churches, and retail organizations. But I must say, what I really enjoyed seeing were many who registered as concerned citizens and the woman who listed her organization as Neighborhood Watch Group, and her title was Housewife. Let me tell you a little about the um, FBI Citizens Academy, if I can get my screen to advance. There we go. Um, we're a, uh, a private, uh, it's, it's still coming up on you here, it's taking a little delay I see in the, in the screen view. The FBI, we're a, a private nonprofit community outreach organization, really promoting a safer community and a positive image of law enforcement. You know, today's webinar is one way, you know, through this education that we try to build safer communities. I'd also like to thank all the chapters uh, who've helped promote uh, today's event. There's actually, you know, 62 chapters across the United States. We have um, 24,000 active members, uh, which is a lot, and most likely the Citizens Academy is near you. If you want to learn more, uh, you can go to the FBI Boston uh, website or our national website. There's some links there. Uh, and again, Dr. Lee will help you out on that, I'm sure. Uh, sponsors. I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, Securitas has been sponsoring the Boston chapter for many years, uh, especially our active shooter workshops. Uh, so please consider the Securitas if you have any protective or preventative needs. And I'd also like to thank uh, Patrick and the CP Journal. Uh, for providing today's session. Uh, Patrick actually uh, spoke uh, at one of our active shooter events or in-person mm -hmm. events last year. Um, and so I know you're gonna like today's uh, session. The other thing that Patrick probably won't tell you, but he has a great online training program. Uh, so if you like what you've seen today and wanna learn more, you can uh, go online and find that. So let me uh, do this now, I wanna introduce Patrick. I'm actually gonna change the presenter yeah, over to Patrick and uh, let him uh, take over here. And uh, I don't know, Patrick, if that's your movement in the background, but someone's got some um, noise going on, and they can make sure they mute it for barrier uh, Jody. It might be me, Chris. Might be you. you. You running around, getting more coffee? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Patrick. Can you, you, you good? Yep, it hasn't come up yet to uh, put the presentation up. There's just a little bit of a oh. delay, but it's working on it. Okay. While, while we're getting your presentation to come up, I've noticed there was a, probably a, almost a two-second delay as I was doing my slides here. But let me, uh, let me introduce uh, Patrick. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he, he presented uh, at our in-person workshop last year. Very actually, very happy to have him here speaking today. Uh, he's the founder and the CEO of the CP Journal. It's based out of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, in this role, he designs and delivers educational programs and behavioral analysis decision-making, and proactive threat recognition for our nation's protectors and public security professionals. Uh, prior to starting his company, Patrick served as an infantry officer in the Marines for seven years, thank you very much, completing two deployments to Iraq, and after serving a number of command and leadership roles, he became the officer in charge for a training team within the Marine Corps Combat Hunter Program out of Camp Pendleton, California. It was in this last role that Patrick teamed up with legendary military author Stephen Pressfield and the co-author of the book, Jason Riley, to publish Left of Bang, How the Marine Corps Combat 
Hunter program can save your life. You know, it's just to help people recognize dangerous individuals and violent situations before an attack begins. Uh, I will add on a little personal note, Patrick is recently engaged, so congratulations to you, Patrick, and your future bride. <laughs> thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for uh, having me today, and also thank you to everyone uh, who took the, took the time to really tune in for this webinar. We have seen that people are joining from around the country, and I know how busy everyone is, so I certainly appreciate your time and uh, effort to learn about what it takes to get left the bang and actually prevent violence from happening. We will talk more about what that phrase means as we go through this presentation, but for public safety professionals, law enforcement officers, corporate security providers, and concerned citizens to really fulfill the expectations that the public has for us, we need to change the way we think about how we approach recognizing threatening people. So take, for example, the Century 16 movie theater in Aurora, Colorado on Friday, July 12th, or July 20th, 2012. During a midnight screening for the newly released Batman movie, The Dark Knight Rises, everything was as it was expected to be during a packed viewing. Batman fanatics had shown up in force to see the movie. People were waiting to get in. There were long lines at the concessions, and movie theater employees were trying to get moviegoers corralled into the lines to wait before they entered the theater. Once they finally got in, they went through all of the previews and public service announcements uh, to turn off your cell phone and be courteous of the people around you that you would expect in a movie. But they were finally at that moment that everyone had been waiting for, and the movie was about to begin. About 20 minutes into the movie, a college student named James Holmes, who had bought a ticket and was sitting in the front row, stood up and left the theater through an emergency exit door that he propped open with a uh, plastic tablecloth holder. James went out to his car that he had parked near the exit, changed into all black clothing, put on a gas mask, a load-bearing vest, a ballistic helmet, a bullet-resistant leggings, a throat protector, a groin protector, and tactical gloves. Ten minutes after he left the theater, he walked back in, and while some people were in denial and were surprised and thought he was playing a prank or was just part of a publicity stunt for the premiere, he surprised everyone when he threw two smoke grenades and opened fire with a 12-gauge shotgun into the crowd of nearly 400 people. Panic ensued in the theater as the smoke grenades caused the fire alarm to go off while he continued to shoot, and he fired a total of 76 rounds into the crowd as he transitioned from a shotgun to a rifle and finally to a handgun. Police were on scene within 90 seconds of the first 911 call. But despite an incredibly fast response, the shooting didn't come without a cost. The reports that we have read about this particular shooting have addressed the impact from three different perspectives. 82 people were casualties, and this was the price paid in the first 10 minutes. And while the impact of shootings, you know, the impact that they have on businesses is absolutely secondary to the lives lost in an event like this, Many of the organizations that security and public safety professionals uh, work with, they do consider the financial impact of violence. The Century 16 Theater was closed for six months. Movies that were waiting to be released had to have scenes changed and scenes re-recorded. And there were a number of other expenses that resulted from this attack to include enhancing security at other theaters with either contract security or police officers around the globe. Finally, it took a toll on first responders uh, as well. 52 police cars responded to this shooting. Hey, Chris, can you, uh, can you mute your microphone? I can hear that. I apologize. It's not mine. Uh, can you just uh, mute yours? Mine has been mute, muted. I'll check with Barry and, and uh, Jody. Okay, thank you. Uh, but as I was mentioning, 52 police cars responded to this shooting. And when you compare this event to situations like the attack last fall in Paris, should another location have become violent as part of a larger coordinated assault, it would have been challenging for authorities to shift and have the resources to handle multiple sites on their own. And regardless of which lens you view this incident through, the question is the same. How do you protect yourself from that risk? How do you ensure the safety of those you are tasked with protecting? I mention this because despite improvements in 
technology and equipment, the number of these attacks continues to rise. And whether you're looking at attacks in public areas or assaults on police officers, we can't rely solely on reporting of a potential threat by concerned individuals because as we've seen, that doesn't always happen. More often than not, the path forward doesn't appear to be very clear cut either. The attackers we are looking for do their best to hide from detection, attack at seemingly random times and locations, study the security procedures and contingency plans so that they can attack vulnerabilities, and they seemingly have the upper hand in each of these events. How we can accomplish this goal of ensuring public safety is going to depend a bit on your role in the overall process. So before we move forward, I'd like to learn just a little bit about uh, those of you who are attending today so that I can tailor the rest of this message a little bit more explicitly to you. Chris, are you able to uh, put that poll up? That, uh... I'll launch it right now. And, uh, and Patrick, what I'm wondering is you've got two computers running. I wonder if you've got the mic on your other computer on. You, maybe you can check that as I, as I launch the poll. That might be where that background noise is coming from. Um, the question, just, just to understand the audience a little, is, is really what best describes your role in public safety. So if you would click on just one of them, uh, even if you're in law enforcement, federal, state, or local, uh, if you're in the military, if you're in what we call corporate security, uh, or you know the, the public safety concerns sort of citizen or civilian, just to give us a little sense, uh, although when you registered, we did identify your role in your organization, but necessarily, um, necessarily what, what role in public safety that you uh, participated in. Well, we've got 80% voting already, so this is going to be great. Um, uh, okay, give me uh, about 30 seconds. We're going to close this, and I'll share it with you. And uh, interesting, there's one group here that's missing. Anyone want to guess what that is? Um, all right, so let me close the poll here, and I'll show you uh, who is here. And everyone actually can get a good sense of this. Um, so up until about a minute ago, uh, there was no military. So we have a 1% military, a good mix between corporate security and public safety, and a little bit of law enforcement. This is great. Um, this is actually who we're targeting the audience, the, uh, the event to. Uh, Patrick, any comments on this? No, that actually uh, helps a great deal, though, because uh, there's certain things that we can uh, kind of address that will fall more in line with the uh, corporate side and the public safety concerned citizen uh, realm here as we go forward. So I certainly uh, appreciate everyone taking the uh, time to do that. Okay, I'm going to close this. Um, and uh, should we get the screen back? Should be back to you now. There we go. Takes a bit to convert over. There you go. I'm going to give it just a second here so that everyone can see the presentation. Chris, is it back up on uh, your screen? or? I, I've got it now. Yep. Go for oh, okay. it. Okay. That's a new one. Is that a, <laughs> I don't know if that was me or not. All right, so for the really the corporate security and public security professionals, as we look for a way to deal with this threat, we can take a look at a very similar situation and look at how the military innovated to deal with really this exact same situation following the fall of Saddam Hussein's regime. So let me explain a little bit. 21 days after the military launched Operation Iraqi Freedom, coalition forces occupied Baghdad. Our American military had just covered more ground. We had moved faster while taking fewer casualties than ever before in history. We had shown the world just how capable our entire military machine could be when we leveraged our advanced technology and our equipment and forced the fighters that were left into an adapt or die situation. And as the Iraqi army was disbanded, the former Iraqi soldiers who were part of the growing insurgency saw firsthand that wearing a uniform and making your intentions known considerably shortened their life expectancy. So they learned very quickly that to undermine our technological capabilities, they had to discard their khaki fatigues and blend back in with the rest of the population. 
And despite one of the most impressive displays of force in the invasion, Marines and soldiers lost the ability to locate and identify the insurgent because they were hiding within the crowd. Chris, I got to ask, is it still coming up on my, uh, it's no longer showing on my screen, so as long as you guys can still see those slides. Uh, me, me, uh, uh, I somehow lost you here. I'm going to put it back to you. Okay. Uh, Sorry about this, folks. Okay. Do you have it now? Uh, I mean, I can I can see it on my main computer, but I just want to make sure that you guys can see the slides. Should be coming to you now. I don't know how it got switched up again. Jeez, uh, someone says they can see the slides. Fine. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Nope. <laughs> now they're lost. <laughs> I'm seeing your um, yeah the logo screen, so which means it's coming to you. So it just just delay the technology. Okay. Must be something about Colorado. <laughs> I'll keep it up. There you go. I've got yeah, your screen no. now. Okay. So you go into the uh, the viewer and it should be fine. Okay. There we go. The yeah, slide that says the result. Okay. Perfect. Correct. So as I was mentioning, throughout the insurgency, Marines were becoming very vulnerable uh, to ambushes and sniper attacks and roadside bombs because since we lost our ability to identify the enemy they became very good at avoiding detection and for the Marines that we were operating with overseas the challenge came down to a single capability that our attackers had by dressing like everyone else in the area the insurgents could simply avoid detection they were able to plan and launch their attacks without a great deal of risk of getting caught because our technology was so uh, superior to theirs. We forced them to adapt and they learned how to operate in this new reality more quickly than we did. What really concerned the military though was that the insurgents began to take the initiative away from us. They could control when they attacked because they could decide when the situation was in their favor and when it wasn't worthwhile to them. The response from Congress to this situation was to simply require more, more of everything, put more body armor on Marines and soldiers, put more armor on our vehicles, require more Marines to be present on the patrol just in case something went wrong. It came from a mindset that we couldn't prevent these attacks from happening, that the only thing we could do is wait to get shot at and hope to protect ourselves from that inevitable so that we could respond once the adversary had revealed themselves. And while the armor is certainly a piece of protecting people, there's a big problem with that as well. It means that oftentimes someone has to get shot at before we know who out there is trying to hurt us. And this realization led uh, Marine General James Mattis, who is just a true warrior, uh, to direct the creation of the Combat Hunter program because he saw this situation as absolutely unacceptable. He said that Marines have to have options beyond just putting on more armor. They must have the ability to be proactive and not just reactive uh, while we're out interacting with the local population. He said that Marines have to have the ability to get left of bang, and that's the moment in 2007 when he started the Combat Hunter course. The goal for the Combat Hunter program was very simple. It was make Marines capable of identifying criminals and attackers before the assault starts. The Combat Hunter program was really teaching Marines how do you read people's behavior so that you can identify those who have uh, a violent intent and who are trying to blend in with the crowd. It changed the way Marines looked at their own safety and security and it took Marines out of the mindset that these attacks were simply unpreventable. It taught us that we could really be proactive. But when I look at the shootings, like the one in Aurora, Colorado, the reason I talk about this is because the thing that attackers are doing here at home is the exact same capability that the insurgents we were dealing with overseas had. We can see a lot of those parallels just through some of our own recent history. We've seen reports about the attacks at the Sikh temple in Wisconsin and other violent attacks that are occurring uh, at religious centers. We've seen shootings at restaurants where authority figures were targeted specifically. We've seen them in schools from the elementary level all the way through universities and even seen a number of incidents on military bases places that you'd expect to have a high degree of security. More often than not though, there's a great deal of collateral damage as the attacker is killing more people than just their intended target. And when you look at these faces and you look at the initial response to these shootings, 
it's often the same as what the military was experiencing overseas in Iraq. In a very simplistic sense, there are only three ways that we can approach security and public safety in order to deal with this type of threat. The first is to simply maintain the status quo. All right, just keep doing what we're doing. If we continue on, eventually, everything will go back to the way we want it to be. There'll be peace, love, rainbows, and unicorns as long as we continue to just keep doing what we're doing and not change course at all. While it's certainly not the approach that we would recommend, we do work with some organizations who uh, see that as the approach. And the second way that we could deal with this type of threat is to increase spending. We could do the same thing that the military did uh, in Iraq, in the early days in Iraq. We can continue to add more guards, more guns, more bulletproof glass, so that we are ready to respond when something bad does happen and hope to deter an attack with a visible security presence. However, when this is done from a defensive mindset, it implies that we are operating under the assumption that these attacks cannot be prevented and that our best chance is to survive the first shot and then respond. When it's done from a determined mindset, though, this approach typically leads uh, to a more aggressive security posture in order to make the attacker second-guess their plan, call it off, or choose something else. And while this works to a point, what the military found taking that approach was that the more aggressive we were as we tried to deter these attacks, the harder it was to work with the population, to earn their trust, and get them to provide the intelligence that we needed. And if you aren't interested in only looking at one of those first two options, either just maintaining the status quo or simply increasing spending, the third option, and the one that we recommend, is instead of armoring up and instead of being reactionary, is to get left of bang. And so to explain the difference in the mindset and in the approach from being reactive to being proactive, I want to spend a minute to explain the terminology and talk about what getting left of bang means so that we're all on the same page. When I say bang, I'm talking about whatever act you are trying to prevent from happening. It's the shooting, it's the stabbing, it's the robbery, it's the assault, it's the fan rushing a stage at a concert. It's whatever you are concerned about and whatever event you don't want to happen. To be left of bang, I want you to start by picturing a timeline and placing bang directly in the middle of that line. Bang is time zero. And when we are left of bang, it means that we are operating earlier on the timeline. It means that we have identified some of those pre-event indicators that exist before the event begins that let us know what is about to happen. Being left of bang means that we have the opportunity to be proactive because we've identified some of those pre-event indicators, those warning signs that let us know bang is about to happen and provides us enough time to intervene before it actually occurs. When we're right of bang, it means that we have missed all of those pre-event indicators and bang has already occurred. When you're right of bang, you didn't have any advance warning and because you simply didn't know or notice any of those cues that were out there. Being left of bang means that we have the initiative and the attacker is reacting to us. And whether we have two seconds or two minutes or two days, this is the absolute goal, to be and to get left of bang. For this to be possible, though, it isn't enough to simply say to you, hey, go prevent violence. I understand that there has to be a how to follow that. And from our uh, experiences working with Marines and soldiers from Special Operations Command, working with police officers at the local and federal level, uh, as well as private security professionals uh, from Fortune 100 companies, when we ask them, how are you going to do this, the answer almost always comes back to say that we simply need better situational awareness. And while that is true to a point, situational awareness is not going to help us out enough. Your awareness needs to be informed. And to take situational awareness down to a very granular level and to make sure that your awareness is very specifically focused on those indicators that are going to help us get left a bang means that you need to know two things. The first, is that you know specifically what you are looking for. And then you have to know how you are going to look for those cues. You aren't going to find pre-event indicators to violence by aimlessly searching. It has to be purposeful. And if you are going to be able to recognize violent people with a success rate of better than 
you have to have a process for systematically searching your surroundings to find those indicators. In having a level of informed awareness is the difference between information hoping and information hunting. And this is the level that we have to get to if we're going to be able to stop all of those acts and all of these shootings that we've continued to see. So with this understanding, it lets us go back to the very, very beginning of everything that it means to uh, be able to recognize threats. If we're going to know what to look for and we're going to know how we're going to look for these cues, we have to start by making sure that we have a shared understanding of simply what makes somebody a threat. Oftentimes this is a question that we'll ask in seminars that stump people. They might not realize what it is that they are specifically looking for or they've never thought about how to answer this question uh, earlier in their career and very often they define it incorrectly. They will oftentimes describe a threat using what we would refer to as the variables that exist in an attack. They might look at things like um, something relating to attacker demographics. They might look for things uh, like race, religion, skin color. They might have a preconceived idea of what an attacker looks like. And the problem with that is there's no set profile for an attacker. An atta a shooter could be any age, any gender, any race, any religion. There is no profile that we can flip through a phone book and find a certain number of people who might conduct an attack. So if we are looking at an attacker demographic, we're always going to be behind the curve. We're always going to be right of bang because we, it, is an, in, in, it is an uninformed search. The second variable, sometimes people will describe violence as a person with a certain cause or a certain motive. The problem is, is people have conducted attacks for every possible ideology, for political, religious, or cultural reasons. Having a specific belief doesn't make someone a threat on their own. So if you're looking or defining a threat that way, again, we're always going to be right of bang because it could include anyone. That's a factor that is always changing. When we talk about what makes someone a threat, we focus on the one and only one constant that exists in each and every single attack that we can actually prevent. And that one thing that never changes in a preventable attack is that the attacker has a violent intent. If you break threat recognition down to its absolute most basic elements, it's really just looking at someone and asking two questions. Does this person intend to kill me or hurt me? And are they capable of doing that? Intentions and capabilities. The problem with capabilities is that we don't always know uh, who might be carrying a gun or that you could kill us in any number of ways, whether it was uh, a gun or your fist or a knife or a bomb. But if we want to be able to get left of bang, what we have to improve is our ability to scan a crowd and look through a bunch of people who we don't have any personal knowledge about and identify those people who have that violent intent. And with this definition of what makes somebody a threat, it actually really specifically informs those two, component, uh, two components that we are trying to get to. We can start by taking a look at how we are going to look for threats, because this is arguably one of the most important parts, because this, this is what lets the search for violent people be deliberate and be repeatable. Without a process for analyzing the people around us, we are really just kind of hoping that someone does something to attract your attention. And while that might work in some situations, I don't want to just rely on luck. And so it has to work in situations that you need to determine if it's a threat when you only have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of information available to you. And a lot of the situations that you find yourself in as a public security professional or a police officer or in corporate security, you never have perfect information about the people around you. You never have a lot of time. So the formula and the structure that we are going to use to allow us to make accurate decisions very, very quickly is this simple three-step formula, this process that's going to structure all of our observations and all of the assessments that we make about people. So let's go through each of these elements here of baseline plus anomaly equals decision. A baseline is simply what's normal for the area you are in and the people you are looking for. Everything and everyone has a natural flow to it. Establishing what is normal and identifying that baseline is the first step in the process. Once we know it's normal, we turn our search to that second part, the anomaly, that thing that stands out from the crowd, that stands out from the baseline. 
while recognizing an anomaly is the absolute goal, this is what's going to get you awards and promotions and public recognition for stopping an attack, being an anomaly or recognizing the anomaly is not the most important part of this little formula that we have. If you think about what being an anomaly is, being an anomaly is a relative term. To stand out, you have to stand out from something. And that something is the baseline, which is oftentimes uh, the most important part of this entire process. If we don't know it's normal, we'll never have a very good definition of what it is that we're looking for, of something that's going to stand out for being not normal. If we were to, when we run seminars, we sometimes will ask the students that we're in, especially those who've never been in the room that we're sitting in before, what they expected when they walked into the room. What do they know is going to be in the classroom? And as we start to look at how we're going to establish a baseline, most of the time people will bring up things like tables and chairs for the students to sit in. They'll bring up uh, the things a student needs, like a uh, handout, pen, paper, coffee. They'll bring up the instructor and everything that we bring with us, a computer, a projector, a screen to display the presentation onto. They will bring up all of those physical and tangible things that they see as being part of the baseline for that classroom or that office building that they work in. But oftentimes that's where they stop. And when they only look at physical characteristics, they expose themselves to a lot of uncertainty about what's normal in their area. So when you talk to sometimes, or sometimes we'll talk to people and ask, well, what makes someone a threat? And they'll talk about uh, the Columbine situation of looking for people wearing trench coats or wearing ski masks. While that might be an anomaly in some situations, if that's the only thing that you have in your baseline of people uh, wearing a trench coat in the summer as standing out, all that attacker has to do to defeat your understanding of what's normal is not dressed differently than everyone else, to put on the same clothes that everyone else has. And as we look at how we are going to establish the baseline for the areas that we are in, what we are going to begin to talk about here are what we refer to as the four pillars of behavior. These four pillars of behavior that I'll highlight here are uncontrollable and universal elements of nonverbal behavior that allow us to apply the same process to any situation and anywhere we go in the world. So we'll start with the uh, first pillar of observable behavior. This is how we assess individual people. People can be assessed as being in one of four categories at any moment in time. We're going to cover this a little bit more on the second half of this presentation. But people are either dominant or submissive or uncomfortable or comfortable. Every single person at every moment in time is in one of these four groups. The second pillar of observable behavior that's going to contribute to our baseline are how we observe and assess group dynamics. Groups of people are going to be assessed by looking at the amount of space and the amount of distance that people keep between them to identify one of four different types of relationships that might define and highlight that specific group. The third thing that goes into uh, how we're going to establish the baseline is going to be the environment. Areas are either a habitual area or an anchor point based on the behavior of the people within. And finally, the last thing that we notice about an area or last pillar that goes into how we're going to establish a baseline is going to be the collective mood. This reveals places that have a general sense of safety or a lacking general sense of safety. If you've ever walked into an area and said, oh, I have a bad feeling about this place or I have a good feeling about this place, the way that we naturally and intuitively assess the collective mood is oftentimes uh, those indicators that you are picking up on and identifying. And so these four pillars of behavior are going to make it very hard for a person to stand out from, or a person to simply avoid detection by dressing like everyone else because they are going to uh, almost always create conditions where you can be an anomaly for other reasons. And these four pillars of observable behavior come from behavioral analysis. And before we get into really how to assess people as being dominant, submissive, uncomfortable, or comfortable, I want to take a minute and just explain what goes into these behaviors because uh, it's a very, very important part of understanding the overall approach that we use to recognize threats. The okay. first is that everything we are talking about here are universal and uncontrollable elements of nonverbal behavior. The universal is important because we can't learn 
uh, Northeast United States threat recognition or California threat recognition or even American threat recognition, the behaviors that we look at have to apply anywhere we go in the world. It cannot be geographically limited or only looking at behaviors of a certain culture. So everything that we're going to talk about that go into those four pillars are universally applicable. The other part of this about being uncontrollable is also very important because if you look at some of the other things that you might hear about as being behavioral cues of a potential threat, let's say a workplace violence situation, sometimes you'll hear about uh, that you're looking for people who have substance abuse problems or marital problems or financial problems or they come to work and talk about their gun collection every single day and those are the things that you're looking for to identify someone as a threat. The problem by looking for those types of indicators is that you have to have very specific knowledge about the person you are searching for. And oftentimes, you're simply not going to have that. If that's all you have to look at, there might be only three or four people in your life that you could really assess as being a potential threat. So by understanding that these behaviors are universal and uncontrollable, we're going to be able to scan a crowd of people that we know nothing about which is an important part of the process. All of these behaviors come from science, which is really important for three reasons. The first is simply a matter of confidence. By understanding that the things that we are going to talk about are objective observations about a person's intentions, people are less likely to question and doubt themselves when they see something that attracts their attention. So by understanding that they can believe in the observations and assessments they're making, our goal is to help empower them to, be, uh, to make more informed judgments and decisions on the ground. The other thing by ensuring that everything comes from science, this ensures that inaccurate indicators about what a threat might look like don't play in. We are not talking about profiling. I don't care what color your skin is and I don't care uh, what God you worship or choose not to worship. On their own, those indicators do not help us recognize people who intend to harm others. And so by ensuring that every observation we make using this baseline plus anomaly equals decision formula are based on objective observations, again, we can help that uh, element of accuracy, ensuring that doesn't come into play. But the most important part of having everything come from science is that we can provide a language and a terminology to help explain what led you to make a decision in the first place. It wasn't that you had a hunch or a gut instinct or uh, something just felt wrong. There's going to be a very quantifiable way that come from those four pillars to describe and communicate and articulate everything that you observed. And finally, as we start to look at the uh, four pillars of behavior and specifically how we're going to assess individuals, know that this came from the military. This was something that the Marine Corps had to create simply because of the threat we were facing overseas. But even though it was created inside of the military, this is not a militaristic program. There's nothing about tactics or uh, room clearing or anything uh, that is super aggressive. Everything that we are talking about has been redesigned for a civilian environment. Everything works within the Constitution and the laws that govern, whether it's law enforcement or corporate security or simply public safety. And so with this understanding of where those four pillars of behavior are going to come from, Let's take a look at very specifically what you can do here. If you are anything like me, when you sign up for a webinar or to attend a class, you're hoping that you're going to walk away with something specific, whether it's a new, uh, new skill or just simply something you can apply when the class is over. And when we teach, we always make it a point. We're not, we don't want to just talk about theory or uh, large, you know, higher scale ideas. I want to make sure that you have something very specific that you can do when you walk away. And so let's start by learning how we're going to assess the intentions of those around us. We're going to start by looking at just the first pillar of observable behavior, how we are going to assess individual people. This is hands down the most important pillar of those four that we just highlighted. If you can't observe and assess an individual, you're certainly not going to be able to put them into groups. If you can't observe an individual, you're not going to be able to understand how they're relating to their environment. And if you can't observe an individual, you're certainly not going to be able to look at and assess the intentions of the collective mood of everyone that's present. While I don't have uh, enough time to 
uh, go into the full explanation of what goes into the what we refer to as clusters. How we are going to establish and read clusters of behavior is one of the most important elements of our program. Sometimes we'll talk to people who are learning to read and assess what a person is communicating non-verbally, and sometimes we'll hear that you know, someone might have read a book or attended another class on body language before, and as soon as they go out in town, they'll find that they struggle with it. They'll go into a busy restaurant like the one here, and they'll try to look at every single hand gesture and every single facial expression and every single thing that a person's doing with their torso or their feet or their legs, and they'll realize very quickly that they are struggling to either collect information that actually leads to a decision or they'll spend three and a half hours trying to look at every single person here and not necessarily be any better off for that effort when it's over. Because we are trying to recognize people who warrant our attention very quickly and very accurately, what we are going to do to look through this room and identify the people who we have to pay attention to is to observe clusters of cues. A cluster is simply three or more gestures, postures, or expressions that all lead to the same conclusion. And we do this for a few reasons. All right, the first is simply for accuracy. All right, since there could be a thousand different things that a person could be doing or meaning if, let's say, you observe them crossing their arms. By finding three indicators, we are going to get to a reasonable level of certainty that what we're observing on a person is not that it is accurate, that we're not letting first impressions play too large of a role. And the second is for speed. By limiting the number of options that we have to observe and assess someone to four options, a person being dominant, submissive, uncomfortable, or comfortable, we're going to be able to move through that room very quickly. We would typically spend a lot of time talking about why these clusters are important and talk about how the brain controls our behavior and more specifically how these clusters are a result of the body's freeze, flight, or fight responses to stresses and threats and how these are uncontrollable and how these are universal elements of behavior. I'll happily go into some of that when we get to the Q&A uh, in about uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, but if something comes up, please bring it up, but just understand that uh, we have to short circuit some of the kind of backstory in terms of why these behaviors are important. So let's start with the first cluster of behavior, the dominant cluster. When we are assessing people who are being and displaying dominance, what we are looking for are people who are using their body to either take up more space by making themselves look larger or by making territorial displays. The dominant cluster is a manifestation of the fight response, and while we aren't necessarily fighting everyone or everything that poses a threat, we often display this behavior when we want to control a situation or by uh, displaying authority. If you take a look at this picture here, and I, I know there might be a delay, uh, but as soon as it comes up, you'll see two people about to engage in a bit of stereotypical road rage uh, overseas. If you take a look at the guy on the right side of the screen, you see how his feet are spread wider than shoulder width apart. Our people don't walk down the street uh, with their feet that far apart. His feet are in a fighting stance. And when we talk about using your behavior or using your body to take up more space, that would be one of those three indicators that we're searching for to assess someone as being dominant. You'd see the man in the white shirt beginning to raise his arms, something that you might otherwise refer to as posturing as he's making himself uh, look larger as soon as the slide changes for you. In the bottom right corner of this screen, you have Marine General James Mattis, right, standing with his hands on his hips. If you were to drop your arms down to your side right now and then place them on your hips, you'll see that your arms are now taking up and commanding a greater amount of space around you than they were when they were just simply at your sides. And when we look at Phil Jackson pointing out towards an audience during a speaking event, you can see that he is gesturing in an authoritative way by being very direct. It's another way people can display dominance. And as you see people point at others with their palms and wrists facing downwards, it helps us identify those people who are in that dominant cluster. And it also leads into talking about territoriality as well. I know that uh, from some of you that I spoke with before today that you are listening to this in a conference room or with a group of people. I am willing to bet that one person came in put their bag or their jacket or their arm over the chair next to it, claiming it as their own. Those are the sorts of territorial displays uh, that we're talking about. It's no different than uh, when you're flying 
you know, and you're trying to battle with the person next to you for control over that armrest. That display of territoriality, those are things that we're looking for in the dominant cluster of cues. And these acts of making yourself look larger are things that we can observe every single day and in a variety of situations. But instead of using words like aggressive or posturing, we're using the word dominant to ensure that everyone knows what we are looking at. And that takes us to the second cluster, all right, how we are going to assess people who are uncomfortable. A person who is acting uncomfortably will be exhibiting signs of a person you might otherwise describe as anxious or agitated or nervous. All right, this comes from the body's flight response to stresses and threats, whereas the dominant cluster is the fight response. What we're looking for with the uncomfortable cluster is the flight response to stress. And so when we talk about behaviors that might be considered blocking behavior. These are things that a person instinctively does to protect vital areas of their body. All right, when a person crosses their arms across their chest, they could be doing that to protect all the vital organs in their torso. Think about when a boxer or a woman raises their shoulders or tucks their chin into their chest to protect their neck uh, from a blow. I know that my younger sister is listening to this in Boston. If you put your hand or you watch her daughter put her hand anywhere close to her neck, you see her shoulders come up and her chin tucks down because she feels uh, very insecure when people start to touch her neck. Those are those indicators from the uncomfortable cluster. You see presenters standing behind podiums when they're nervous and use that as a barrier the same way there's probably really at least one dad listening to this who has turned their chair around backwards when they want to have that awkward conversation with their son and using the back of that chair as another barrier, something to put between themselves and the person they are talking to. The uncomfortable cluster is the flight response, and our body will generate energy to put separation between ourselves and others. And when we're in situations where that can't be released through actual flight or through distancing ourselves, you'll oftentimes also identify the uncomfortable cluster through what we refer to as pacifying behaviors. These are those little anxious, nervous, shifty things that you do when you're in a situation that uh, you can't get out of and whether that's rubbing your hands together or rubbing your neck or uh, drying sweaty palms on your pants. These pacifying behaviors reveal the uncomfortable cluster and can be seen how many people use their cell phone while waiting in line or fixing themselves to look as presentable as they can before meeting with someone. Our third cluster that we'll move through uh, pretty quickly because I know we're getting close to the hour is the submissive behavior. This is our third cluster and is the exact opposite of dominance. These are people who are displaying a lack of a fight response in response to a perceived stressor or threat. We'll identify this by looking for people who are maybe using their body language to make themselves smaller. All right, they might retract their arms or legs uh, into their body as a way to take up less space. This might be behavior you might otherwise call shy or meek or timid. And this is something that you might oftentimes see when you look at an abused spouse or an abused child in the presence of the abuser. If they've decided that the best way out of a situation is to simply um, make themselves smaller, not fight back, and not protect themselves. But at the same time, this is something that you will see when a person respects and has a true degree of admiration for others. And if you think about uh, how you might behave when your boss walks in the room or uh, in front of someone that you have a good deal of admiration for. Some of these behaviors simply help us identify those people who are showing a bit of deference to others. And finally, a person who is feeling comfortable is a person who is not perceiving a threat. This is the fourth cluster, and whereas dominance, submissiveness, and discomfort all reflect a person who is perceiving a threat or perceiving a stressor, the comfortable cluster is our catch-all that shows when people are not displaying any sort of uh, response to their situation or the people around them. When you look at people standing with uh, one leg up on a wall or standing with their feet crossed, they're certainly not in a position to fight or flight their way out of, a, out of that uh, area. When you look at people uh, who are uh, leaning in closer to each other, they wouldn't close the distance between themselves and someone they trust or love if there was something there that was causing them to pick up on a stress. And these are all indicators from the comfortable cluster, and you can also see this, especially with the use of technology, when people are willing to let their situational awareness go down to zero. All right, they are obviously very comfortable in that situation. They wouldn't do it if they necessarily felt threatened. 
And these four clusters, dominant, submissive, uncomfortable, and comfortable, are ones that you can make on each and every person that you look at. Everyone is falling into one of these four clusters. And the faster you can get at assigning people to a cluster and capturing the three cues that support your assessment, the more effective you can be in this approach. But just remember the overall strategy that we're using. Baseline plus anomaly equals decision. The baseline is simply the starting point. It's the first cluster that you notice about a someone, and then you're looking for changes which reflect the anomaly. Or you're looking at the environment and trying to find a cluster of behavior that doesn't fit in. These four clusters are what we are going to use to begin identifying this because these are all uncontrollable responses to how people perceive their surroundings. And when we use our baseline plus anomaly equals decision structure, we have a process for determining which behavior should attract our attention and which ones are just part of the norm. We have a way of identifying the individual within the crowd. We have a way of finding a specific tree within the forest. And we can begin taking informed action on people, starting with simply identifying what cluster a person is in, dominant, submissive, uncomfortable, or comfortable, and asking ourselves, does that fit our baseline? Does that make sense here? If it does, then you don't have to worry about it. But when a behavior does not make sense and doesn't fit the baseline, you can be confident taking action uh, with that person. Even just as something as simple as having a conversation or calling local authorities or calling for support. And we do this by, we, we break individuals down into these four groups because they're all inclusive. Everyone can fit into one of those four groups and then we can use it to quickly identify and break down the situations to figure out who warrants our attention. When we get, when we work with some of our clients, they've, we've seen that they have used these skills in oftentimes three different applications from threat recognition and personal safety. They've applied these behaviors in conversation, whether that's interviewing or sales or a de-escalation tactic to figure out how you get a person who is displaying the dominant cluster into the comfortable cluster so that you can have a more rational and less emotional conversation. We've seen people use this uh, on the corporate side for surveillance detection, identifying those people uh, who might be uh, collecting information or intelligence about a specific building. And if you're interested in learning more, there are two things that I want to briefly hit on. The first is through our book, Left of Bang, uh, which talks about all the behaviors that go into the program and that came from the Marine Corps Combat Hunter program. And you can also find us uh, online. In 2011, uh, the CP Journal began as an outlet to teach behavioral analysis on a broader scale to audiences outside of the U.S. military and who are looking for a system to improve their ability to recognize pot uh, potential threats. And through conducting in-person seminars, we realized that a lot of our clients wanted a way to scale this training to a broader audience when, when people can't be in the same place at the same time, how to build a common language and process to observe and recognize the people that uh, stand out from the crowd and how they can reinforce that training uh, which historically meant copying someone else's notes and with that feedback we were able to build uh, as Chris mentioned our online program which allows organizations to scale this to anyone anywhere at any time they can train with us as long as they have the internet uh, we can establish a universal language and we can also help a pro establish a process in organizations who are looking for consistency and at the same time, it's a not a overly systemized process, so it can be applied to uh, any situation that you might find yourself in. And that is the absolute goal of getting left the bang, of how are we using these behaviors to recognize those people uh, who stand out from the crowd. I realize I'm running up on the hour. I was going to talk quickly about uh, situational awareness, but I'll, instead of the backstory, what I'll give you is just the main takeaway. There are more or less five different conditions of alertness uh, that you might be in awareness at any given time. When a person doesn't know what to look for, what they end up being is being right of bang because they were looking, it's a person who even if they had the best intentions was looking for threats, but they didn't know what was going to make someone stand out other than visually seeing a gun or visually seeing a knife or visually seeing a fight. And if that's the first time you realize that there is a threat present, you're now reacting. You are right of bank. You missed all those other warning signs. The reason we talk about behavior and the reason we talk about these four pillars of behavior is because once you know how to establish a baseline, 
even in very time constrained situations where you only have two seconds or two minutes, any time left to bang when you've identified a threat and have a chance to plan through what your response is going to be, as soon as we provide you with that time and that space to make those decisions, we create more options and opportunities for you to actually prevent the attack instead of waiting for it to occur and simply reacting. Here's just one final quote that I pulled from uh, Gavin De Becker, and we are evaluating people all of the time. And when it comes to uh, believing and trusting and being confident in those decisions, it's something that many people lack because oftentimes we just let this happen at a subconscious level. The reason we establish these four pillars of behavior is because we can break it down very specifically to observations that you can believe in. And the way that you do that is just by working through these three pieces. The baseline plus anomaly equals decision. And so if I only leave you with one thing, I would just ask that it would be uh, this slide that's coming up right now. If you were to translate that baseline plus anomaly equals decision structure into something you can use in any situation, just constantly be asking yourself these three questions. And you walk into an area, just ask yourself, what's going on here? What's normal? What's my baseline? And once you know what's going on here, you can answer that second question. If I know people here are confident or are comfortable, what's going to make someone stand out? It's going to be anything other than the comfortable cluster. It could be dominance or submissiveness or discomfort. If it's not comfort, it warrants your attention. And finally, think through and anticipate and simulate what you're going to do once you recognize the anomaly. You don't have to wait for that gun to be drawn to feel confident taking action. But if you haven't planned through the responses and thought through what you're going to do, you risk hesitating and you risk uh, really valuable seconds that could be the difference between, unfortunately, uh, you know, a successful and a, ne and a very negative outcome. So please, as you go forward, just constantly be asking yourself these three questions. And as we open it up to some question and answer time, one, I wanted to give uh, everyone all of my personal contact information. Uh, if there's anything that we can do to answer some questions, we certainly will. I know that many of you are going to have some schedules uh, that you have to move on. So if you have questions, we're going to open up for some Q&A now. Any question, though, that uh, I don't answer, on Tuesday when Chris sends out a summary email, every single question that we receive will be posted on our website. We'll provide that link uh, in the email. So even if we don't answer your question today, uh, we certainly will. Thank you for your time and thank you for attending. Uh, and just one last message, just constantly try to focus on getting left to bang so that you can stay there. Thank you. Patrick, uh, first thank you, but you should have probably asked me how many questions there were before you said you're going to answer all of them, okay? Uh-oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what I'm going to suggest, only because it is I've got like one minute before 2 o'clock, um, and so I'm going to ask Patrick that you do answer all the questions. We've got a bunch of them here. Um, I absolutely will. Respecting people's time. Uh, we're going to end this uh, now. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I, this is, I think, the, I think that's the second time I've heard you. I've gone through the book, you know, been, been through your website and the training. Uh, um, so this is awesome. And I, I really appreciate it. Uh, so, but I, I do want to ask if you could get those uh, questions answered online. And, and what we'll do to those listening, uh, yes, we did record this. We're still getting some, some questions about that. We, we have recorded it. Uh, we're going to get it loaded probably on the Boston chapter of the FBI Citizens Academy Alumni Association's website uh, early next week. But everybody that's here and anyone that's registered will get a, uh, an email with a link to that. Uh, I do apologize. There was some audio issues early on. I really apologize for that. Um, had this a few times with this uh, service. But uh, hopefully the, the audio, you can play over and over again and, and really understand what, what, what Patrick was saying. <laughs> First, Patrick, thank you again very, very much. Uh, I'd also like to thank Securitas again as a sponsor, and I'd like to thank all the chapters of the FBI Sins Academy Alumni Association for helping uh, put this on. Uh, getting a lot of questions still coming in. What I'm going to do, uh, Patrick and uh, Jody and Barry are also listening and helping out. I'm going to end it here. I'm going to put it on pause, but I'm going to leave the, the program going so people want to put questions in. Uh, please do so, and they'll keep uh, Patrick busy all weekend, which is great. <laughs> uh, I'm also, uh, you'll probably also see an email uh, from us, hey, we'd like to get some feedback, but also 
uh, want to give maybe a suggestion of what are the topics you'd like to do. It seems like this has been very successful based on what we're seeing feedback. And I'm a big fan of situational awareness, which is why Patrick was involved, and maybe want to do more of those. So, uh, Patrick, thank you very, very much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm going to put this on pause right now, and then uh, you can still type in any questions or comments. Thank you. Hey, Yeah. Well, what time was my computer? You know, I don't know if it was. Go on AOL and see if you can log in and see if it works. If not, or just, I just want to see if it's okay. Okay, just close that. Is this AOL? Anyone that's listening, please.